Welcome to another Calvary Baltimore B-Side with our senior pastor, Josh Plantholt. B-Sides are a companion to the weekly sermon, giving an in-depth look behind the teaching. Now with running commentary to complement this week's sermon, here's Pastor Josh. For the video here, happy B-Side. Uh, we're in Revelation 14 today. <clears throat> Uh, let's let's hop on to verse one here, and I'm if you notice I'm moving a little quicker because we just did Psalm 130. Uh, verse one, <clears throat> I'm really excited about this. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard the voice from heaven, like the sound, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And I heard the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. I was so tempted to put this in Sunday's teaching. I mean, so tempted. Uh, but we were we were running out of time. It's it's funny. Um, if you've noticed, the teachings have gotten a little longer over the last three or four weeks, uh, and that's partly because I'm trying to cover more distance uh, in Revelation and and even in the Psalms, quite frankly, and. Uh, and so I'm trying to faithfully explain what's happening while still giving adequate application, but it's running longer and longer. And so on Sunday, I had to edit while I was preaching because I'm going, uh-oh, we're running out of time. Um, so th there were two things I really wanted to talk about on Sunday that we just, it would have made the teaching too long. And, and I didn't want to, you know, frustrate people and the Sunday school workers. Uh, but I want to talk about these harps because... When we see harps in scripture, we can rightly think of when you think of a harp. Now you're thinking harp Bible. What are you thinking of? You're thinking of David. You're thinking of the Psalms. You're thinking of Old Testament worship, right? This is a good thing. But, but question, who were the first recipients of the letter of Revelation? The seven churches in Asia Minor. This letter was received predominantly by the Gentiles, Greeks, and Romans. And one of the earliest church fathers, Clement of Alexandria, notes, and this is a really early letter, but Clement of Alexandria notes that Christians did not use harps in their worship services in his day. So in the early church, and this is so important, this is so cool, the early church did not use harps in their worship services. And Clement of Alexandria, a really early church father, a patristic father, he says because they were considered too secular. <laughs> Harps in the early church were considered too secular for Christian worship. Now, for those of you that have been brought up in legalistic traditions, like independent fundamentalist Baptists or some Pentecostalism can go this way, there's a movement in those circles that guitars are evil, that drums or any stringed instruments are too secular to be played at church, it's bad juju. <laughs> and here what we're seeing from Clement of Alexandria with the harps in the early church, there's nothing new under the sun. Here we see from church history that the early church, the early Christians, harps were considered too secular to be used in synagogues or, or churches because... The Romans used them in their pagan worship services and in their festivals. And so the thought was, by the early pastors, let's not use harps because we don't want to stumble new converts. We don't want to stumble new converts if our worship instruments are the same ones used in the pagan services that they used to attend. So let's just not use harps lest it reminds people of Rome and, and all of the evils that are part of Rome's use of the harp. And yet here we are, to the shock of, of many in the early church, I'm sure, God was using harps in his worship service. <laughs> Imagine if God gave this letter today, uh, and and these independent fundamentalist Baptists got a letter from God and the heavenly choir has drums and guitars. <laughs> this would be such a shock to them. Uh, and, and so I'd like to make a brief remark on this. There's nothing wrong 
with instruments and worship. If there was, the 144,000 are sinning. So it's okay. Yet there are plenty of churches today that say anything besides a piano or an organ is too secular. But but the funny part to that is, when the organ was introduced to the church back in the mid-ages, many people thought that the organ was too secular. <laughs> that only voices should be allowed. So, uh, even all the way back, you know, people say only the harp or uh, an organ or a piano can be used today. But that used to be considered secular at some point, too. There's nothing wrong with instruments and in worship. If there was, I wouldn't have any part to do with it. I don't care what's popular. I don't care what is going to draw people. Here, here's a fun fact. If the church uses carnal means it will to attract carnal people, the church will become a carnal church. I don't want to use inappropriate evil means to attract people because it's going to create an inappropriate church. And at the end of the day, I just want to be faithful to God. So there's nothing wrong with instruments in church. Psalm 96 says that we are to make new songs before the Lord, new worship songs. But here's my thinking. What are all these instruments being used to do? Because there's always nuance. These harps are there to facilitate worship. And here's, here's the counter to this. Because, yes, instruments are good, I think, and right to use in, in worship service to, to facilitate worship. But at some point, at some point, instrumentation, 20-part harmonies, two drummers with six smoke machines and a light firework show, at some point, a church's worship service becomes a performance that an audience watches. And when that happens, I believe it is then crossing into something sinful. But if the guitars, the drums, the harmonies, if all of those things are leading God's people into worship and praise for the Lord, then they are an aid and a blessing. And here is the 144,000 with harps that they praise God with. And it facilitates worship. So, so here's your litmus test. If you are watching a church service and you are constantly being impressed with what they're doing, that then is becoming a, a, at least an inappropriate distraction for you. Now, you might have a sensitivity to that, right? But it's not the, the worship team is not performing... Uh, in, in that way, have all of the music, all the instrumentation, all the people singing, all of that is really to get the real worship going, and that is the congregation, which is why our church has been so precious to me recently, because when we sing, we sing. <laughs> and the congregation it, it genuinely enters into worship, and it drowns out the guitar, the piano, and all those sorts of things, because I believe this is what the guitar and the piano and all those sorts of things are desiring to do to enter God's people into worship and praise. And so, uh, pro-instruments, but to a point. <clears throat> uh, verse 3. Now they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So Zion, Zion was the city of David, a city that David conquered, by the way, and it was a fortress city. So the city of David was, from the beginning, a fortress, like we saw in Psalm chapter 2. Behold, I've set my king on his holy my king on his holy hill of Zion. So it's a fortress city that the Messiah, that, that Jesus, would rule and reign out of. And here we are in the book of Revelation, and the 144,000 warriors of the Lamb and the Father in Zion, they also worship. In the Bible, a music and war often go together. Isn't that fascinating? Remember, it was, do you remember when the walls of Jericho fell down? 
It was when the priests played their instruments, which facilitated the worship of God's people. Do you remember Gideon? They broke the clay pots with the torches and blew. They blew their their horns. And there was an instrument of worship uh, to the Jewish people. And that's when the enemy fell. In the Exodus, Pharaoh being defeated in the Red Sea was immediately celebrated by worship. We have that beautiful song of Moses in, in the Exodus. When Babylon is destroyed in the book of Revelation, it is immediately connected with worship. Worship in and warfare are often connected in the Bible. And here we see the 144,000 are worshipers and warriors. You know, Martin Luther used to say, nothing drives the devil out, and I'm paraphrasing here, nothing drives the devil away more than worship. You know, one of my advices, I, I'm not a very, uh, I'm a Pentecostal man, but I'm not very Pentecostal as far as the denomination goes. Um. <laughs> but one of the advice I give, because I, I truly believe worship is warfare, and I truly believe Satan, according to as we read in the Bible, cannot stand godly Christ-exalting music. Godly music. And so one of my advice to people who are going through spiritual things is to fill your home with worship. Fill your home with worship music and sing to the glory of God. It will drive evil away. <laughs> And so if we apply this to ourselves, if we are going to be faithful warriors of Jesus Christ to wear the armor of God, who do resist the devil, then we also must be worshipers. God's army must gather together and we must sing to our God if we are to fight valiantly. There's a reason from the very beginning, worship was an integral part to the early church. They learned this from Jesus. They learn this from the apostles. You know, we get accounts of, of, of the disciples asking Jesus how to pray. But one of the things that we see all do is the early church must have been so impacted by how Jesus sang. We don't know much about this in Scripture, but, but I have no doubt that when he praised the Lord, there was a tangibility to it. There was an unexpressible sweetness to it. But how cool for the early apostles to be standing with you know, we, we know that right after right right after the supper, uh the, the last supper ended, they sang a hymn together. And and how how precious must that be to sing with God? And the sweetness that accompanied that. I, I can only imagine. Uh, and so if we're to fight valiantly, uh, we're, we need to be worshipers because worship is warfare. <clears throat> um, verse 4, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, the 144,000, for they are virgins. I read so much stuff on this passage. It was unbelievable how much content there was on the 144,000's chastity. <laughs> I read so much on this. The reality is that this verse makes very little sense, unless you remember the context. These 144,000 from the fortress of Mount Zion, that the city of David, the city of the king, are a priestly army unto the Lord. And if you did a study on sexual purity in the Torah, that there are deep connections to purity for both worshipers and warriors. You know, one of the things we see from Leviticus 15 is that men and women were to refrain from sexual relations before entering into the presence of God until they were washed and purified. So if a man or a woman... Uh, slept together, had sex, uh, before they entered into the presence of God, there was a washing. They needed to cleanse themselves before they came into the presence of the Lord. Well, interesting, in Deuteronomy 23, the war camp is talked about as a holy sanctuary before God. 
Isn't that fascinating? The soldiers out in battle, in their camp, is talked about in the same way as the God's holy sanctuary. And the same purifications a husband and a wife were to make before coming to the sanctuary to God is the same purification that a warrior was supposed to have before coming back to camp. Now, if you have little kids, you may want to mute me for 30 seconds uh, if you have sensitive ears near you. But um, what we see in Deuteronomy 23 is that if men had a, had a, a nocturnal omission or a wet dream, um, when they woke up and, and saw the mess and <laughs> realized what they had done, they needed to go and purify themselves, wash themselves as if they had had intercourse uh, before they could come back into the war camp. And it's talked about in the same exact way as the holy sanctuary of God. And so what we're seeing is that the war camp was also an act of worship, every bit as the tabernacle was uh, at, at this time, which is just a fascinating connection. But doesn't this, so so you needed to purify yourselves before entering into the presence of God, whether it be at the tabernacle or the war camp. But doesn't this shed some light on the story of David and Uriah? When Uriah refused to sleep with Bathsheba because it was improper to sleep with his wife when his fellow soldiers were at war. And one of the reasons for this is because he would have to purify himself before returning back to camp. And he was ready to return to the fight as the battle was not yet over. Isn't this fascinating? Uriah didn't want to go sleep with his wife and then have to go and purify himself. And then run back to the battle that was still raging on. No, he wanted, like the 144,000, to be chased and ready. So, in some great sense, Uriah is the warrior that David should be. David's in his palace when the kings go off the war. David can purify himself. David can sleep around. But Uriah is a faithful servant. He's ready to go. He does not want to be in Zion one more second than he has to because the battle is still at hand. And so here's the point. This is a holy priestly army who are faithful and pure and ready to fight and ready to worship and ready to fight for the Lord in total devotion. The 144,000 in some ways like Uriah are undistracted, uh, 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 unpersuaded. They are ready to, to serve the Lord at a drop of a hat, in a moment's notice, there's no time for purification. The time for service is now, and so they're ready. Like the, the parable of the ten virgins. Five needed to fill their lampstands, and five were ready, standing at attention. Here, these 144,000 are ready to serve the Lord. That's what this seems to be implying as we connect it to Zion. Now, also... John MacArthur made a really cool point uh, uh, here uh, in his commentary. He says, quote, The worship of Antichrist during the tribulation will be unspeakably vile and perverse. As it did in the fertility cults of ancient times, sexual sin will apparently run rampant. Even in the current grossly immoral day, we can hardly imagine what the deviant sexual perversion of the tribulation will be like. With all divine restraint removed, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6-7, and the unbelieving wor a world uh, judgmentally abandoned by God, Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28, sin will be released like a flood in, uh, inundating the world. What MacArthur points out that I think is a really great pastoral insight, one that I'm not sure a, a, a purely theologian or an academic would pick up on, but certainly a, a pastor who's thinking of souls. It, it, not that theologians aren't, but you know what I mean, someone who does shepherding work regularly. And his insight is, is that during the, during the end times, during a time of great evil, if God's restraining hand is being removed, as these 144,000 are sexually pure, they are sexually pure in a time of rampant evil sexuality. 
in a time when everyone's sleeping with everybody, they are faithful. You know, the 144,000 will resist and keep themselves pure. And so God has done quite a work in these 144,000. Quite a work. Uh, also, one more thought here before we keep reading. Uh, and, and you know, every once in a while, we, we put on our tinfoil hats, right? And so this means, you know, take this loosely. Don't make any doctrines out of this. Don't die on this theological hill. <clears throat> but... Uh, one, one of the guys that I, I, I've spent a lot of time reading, I mean, I don't agree with a lot of the things he gets to, but is a guy by the name of Dr. Michael Heiser. And he does a lot of work in um, inner, inner uh, testamental literature. And he really specializes in the book of First Enoch. Now, the book of First Enoch is a book that is not in the Bible. Um, there, when, when the canon was being assembled, uh, there were some people who thought that First Enoch should be canonical in the canon, and there were some who thought that uh, the the Book of First Enoch should not be canonical. Uh, and most of the church agreed that First Enoch should not be in the Bible because of the criteria that they had. Now, given most of the Bible was already assembled when these councils came together, but there were some works that they wanted to see. Jude was another one that they were having a hard time figuring out if it should fit. Um, but but first Enoch, and one of the reasons first Enoch so attractive is because it seems to be referenced in a few different points. It is referenced in a few different places in the scriptures. Jude talks about it. Second Peter talks about it. Uh, it seems to shed light on Genesis six, and Daniel talks about the Watchers. Uh, so there's lots of connections to the Bible to to first Enoch. Um, now in first Enoch, the story goes that. Um, there were all these people in charge of keeping watch over the earth, all these sons of God. They were angelic-like creatures. And uh, Genesis chapter 6, you can read it. The sons of God saw that the daughter of men were pretty beautiful, however it's worded, and they slept with them. And from them came the men of renown, uh, which, which First Enoch says that these men of renown were giants, uh, this is where we get the Anakim uh, from, and eventually the Nephilim from, which Goliath was a descendant of uh, these uh, giants. And so first, Enoch talks about these watchers, the sons of God, who saw the daughters of men and came down and slept with him. Uh, then. Now, here we are in Revelation 14, and we have new sons of God. We have 144,000 watchers, and they watch over the earth, and they play instruments, and they had care over the earth. And so they watch over the earth, but the, the sins that the watchers had when they saw the daughters of men and came down and defiled themselves, here the 144,000 are chased. They are virgins. They resist the temptation that the watchers failed at, and they do not sleep with the daughters of men. Um, there, there's some pretty strong connections here. I, I'm not confident at all that these things are meant to be connected, um, but for those of you that are interested in intercanonical works or intertestamental works, uh, just something to tuck away um, the thought, huh, Maybe there's a connection here, an illusion here, um, that God's building upon. Again, I, I would lean no, but it was valid enough to throw your way. And if you want to catch it, catch it. If not, don't. Uh, but it seems to be something there. <clears throat> um, let's keep going. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed for mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was no lie was found, for they are blameless. Uh, the last thing I'd like to point out, and this is literally a minute, uh, is that it says that the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever he goes. I love that. <laughs> I absolutely adore that line. I pray that God thinks that way about us. Don't you? Josh follows the lamb wherever he goes. 
Maureen Terry follows the lamb wherever he goes. Mark follows the lamb wherever he goes. God, I hope God thinks that way about us. And if it's not true, may it be true. You know, when I pray, I say, God, if there's anything in me that needs to go, please remove it. If there are things I'm holding on to that are not good for me, that, that are not of you, God, please remove it. I want to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That wherever he is at, we are. This is one of the reasons we need to meet a church on Sunday. Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. He is with his church wherever two or three are gathered. In his name, he is there. I want to be where our Lord is. And he is a church on Sunday. And so we go. And I want to be wherever he's in. <laughs> we are. I if he's in something, if it's if it's godly, if it's pure, if it's noble, I want to follow the lamb into it. I want to pursue godly things that he's in favor of. And so as we look at these 144,000, these 144,000 are a unique group of people, but I believe there's a part here that's set up as, as a, a model for us. That God's mighty warriors follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And may this be said of us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, I love you guys so much. For those of you that made it this long, I love you. <laughs> uh, uh, this new camera situation, if you liked it, let me know. If you didn't, well, keep it to yourself. No, please tell me. Um, it's a better camera, but I don't know if the angle's better. Uh, so I don't know, just trying something out. Um, and I'm, I have a project coming up here for, for the church in, in a little bit that, um, I'm just working out the camera situation here. So anyways, I love you all so much. Let's pray. Uh, God, we, we ask that you would be with us and protect us and strengthen us and help us to be godly men and women and help us to be worshipers. Help us to worship boldly and, and mightily and passionately for your glory. May, may we enter into a Trinitarian worship. And God, we pray like the 144,000 that we may be ready. That, that when the time comes, God, we are already dressed in our armor. We are prepared and ready for action. Like the parable of the faithful virgins, God, let our lamps be full. And God, we, we also pray that you help us to follow the lamb wherever he goes. God, where, when you are in something, let us be in it with you. And when you are repulsed by something, help us to be repulsed by it with you. Please, God, guide us in this through the power of your Spirit. Have mercy on us and pour out your Spirit abundantly, we pray. And in Jesus' name, we love you, God. We praise you. Amen. I love you all so much, and I'll see you Sunday. Thanks for joining us for this Calvary Baltimore B-Side. If you'd like to get in touch or come visit us at Calvary Baltimore, our website is calvarychapelbaltimore.org. You can email us at calvary.faithlife at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. If you've been blessed by today's teaching and would like to donate to the work that God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Donate Now. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word to live the Word to share the Word. And join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore B-Side. <laughs>